thank you so much for joining today's Female Founder Showcase that's being hosted by the Cartier Women's Initiative. My name is Ariel Molino with the SANCOP Forum team, and I'm delighted to have you all here today. And we are equally, if not more, delighted to be partnering with Cartier to be hosting this session uh, today. So uh, welcome. I will hand it over to Winji, who is the Global Program Director of Cartier, to take us through today's session. Welcome, Winji, and welcome to all the wonderful ladies who are pitching today. Thank you, Ariel. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, um, my name is Winji Sampayo, and I'm the Global Program Director for the Cartier Women Initiative. Um, just a few housekeeping. Session. As we go through the today's uh, email files to showcase the various fellows within our program, um, please feel free to type your questions and comments in the comment section. Um, and also, uh, if you can please uh, mute yourself during uh, the session so that we can avoid some background noise. And of course, last but not least, uh, make sure to visit our uh, various folk fellows uh, virtual booth uh, to check out more further about their business. The Cartier Women Initiative's vision is a world in which every woman impact entrepreneur driving social and environmental change can achieve her full potential. Our work started about 15 years ago when we launched an initiative and it is culminated into an annual international entrepreneurship program that aims to drive change by employing women impact entrepreneurs. We work specifically with impact driven businesses that are for profit that are woman-led and are early stage in their formation, so less than five years old. Our guiding principle um, leads our work, and we believe that every woman can be extraordinary change agents in the world by leveraging business as a force for good. We also believe that we can contribute by creating opportunities for everybody, and as talent is universal, but opportunities have not been so. We're constantly learning and we are always uh, open for the possibility that there's something that we have not learned and could make us stronger and better. We also see beyond ourselves and we care for the team and communities that we work with and that we are part of. Our mission is to work with women impact entrepreneurs by providing them with uh, and connecting them with financial, social and human capital support so that they can grow their business and their leadership skills. Our program is, uh, is uh, divided into sort of four main pillars. First is our awards, which has been um, to shine a light on the 40, uh, 20, 24 women entrepreneurs each year uh, by providing them grant funding and also media visibility um, towards their business that is uh, driving social and environmental change. We also have a fellowship program that is a one year long program where we offer our human capital support to the women entrepreneurs, focusing specifically on um, strategic financial skill set, speaking to inspire, and also impact measurement. The third pillar of our work surrounds around community, and this is not only be between connecting women impact entrepreneurs with each other, but also with their supporters. And last but not least is our third thought leadership work, where we are trying to advocate for the important cause of business as a force for good, and specifically women's role within that. So without further ado, I'm happy to share with you the first theme of today's Female Founders Showcase, Preserving the Planet. And our first speaker is Joanne, who's the founder of Planet Protector Packaging from Australia. Joanne, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, Wimji. I'd like to share my screen. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Winji. Who would have thought that the humble sheep would be a secret weapon to defending our planet? My name is Joanne Howard. I'm the founder and CEO of Planet Protector Packaging. I'm thrilled to be here today to share with you my story. Planet Protector is in a race to eliminate polystyrene. Polystyrene is a disaster for the planet. 8 million metric tons of plastic end up in the ocean every year. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation predicts that by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. More plastic than fish? 
It is estimated that polystyrene takes 500 plus years to break down and a shocking 42% of the plastic in the ocean emanates from the packaging industry. But polystyrene is not just a problem for the planet. It's an enormous challenge for businesses. They pay to store it and transport it, and then they pay to dispose it. It reflects negatively on their corporate social responsibility and their sustainability goals. And they pay inflated insurance premiums because polystyrene is a flammable, dangerous good. Until now, there has not been a viable, sustainable alternative. The solution, my solution, is wool. What we have done is use a waste stream to create an ingenious product that replaces polystyrene. Woolpack offers superior thermal insulation. It is biodegradable, recyclable, and 100% renewable. It provides cushioning in transit, is compliant with all food safety and pharmaceutical standards, as well as being airline approved. The product arrives flat packed and it's really easy to assemble. No more shipping air. So who uses Woolpack? We operate in the food, seafood and pharmaceutical sectors. These are the three largest users of polystyrene in packaging. We have 337 customers across Australia and New Zealand, and we have the proud partners to DHL, Blackmores, and Baxter Pharmaceuticals, to name just a few of the iconic global brands that have already made the switch. Importantly, we have focused on ensuring that our business is well defended. We have patented technology, we have a well-developed and exclusive supply chain, we have process power, and a proprietary blend of fibres, strong brand awareness with loyal customers and multi-year supply agreements, and we have collaborative relationships with governments and industry bodies. We currently operate in Australia and New Zealand only. This represents a meagre 1.3% of the total global market. Asia, right on our doorstep, represents a massive 43% of the total available global market. Smithers Pira report that almost 75% of all new product launches in the retail sector between now and 2023 will be in Indonesia, China and India. These market statistics further reinforce our strategic decision to establish operations in Southeast Asia. We invested heavily in R&D and new product innovation. Our new lobster protector has attracted global interest. For us, this is a $10 million industry segment and just literally a drop in the ocean of what is the potential globally. Our wine protector is a solution designed for cellar doors and our garden range is currently under development in collaboration with our largest landscaping retailer. For such a small team, I am so proud of the incredible impact to date. We've removed almost 6.5 million polystyrene boxes from supply chains, diverted 3,000 tonnes of waste wool away from landfill. We've given it a new life and commercial value. We've generated close to 5 million in new revenue for sheep farmers. We are poised to scale. We plan to raise five million US dollars of smart capital in the first quarter of next year. The funds will be used for new product development, accelerating and funding sales growth, and vertically integrating a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility with capacity to service the Asian market. We've won multiple um, awards and global recognition for our innovation and sustainability. This is just the beginning. We are looking for long-term impact-focused investors with strategic expertise in our space. If this is you, we would welcome the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me today to share with you my vision for a polystyrene free world. Great. Thank you so much, Joanne, for sharing uh, with us about your work uh, with Planet Protector Packaging. Um, if anyone has...
if anyone has any question, please feel free to type it on the comment box and we can moderate the questions for Joanne. Ah, we have our first question. How is the supply chain from the waste collection to converting it into a pet, uh, into packaging product manage? So we work, um, we work with lots of local farmers. We've established our supply chain. It took a long time to get things right. In hindsight, I was thinking that Australia is one of the best sheep countries in the world, um, but it's more the crossbred. It's not the merino wool that we use. Um, it's more of the crossbred, and we do a lot of that out of New Zealand as well. Um, and it's the coarse, medulated fibres that are ones that we need. Um, so, yeah, so we've got no issues at all. Sheep are shorn once a year. Um, each uh, sheep yields about three kilos in wool. And, of course, wool is 100% renewable. Great. Thank you, Joanne. Um, our second question is from Nikki, who asked us, uh, uh, what is your business model? My business model at this stage, when we started, we were direct sales, um, liaising directly with customers, opening um, opportunities. Um, two years ago, we first we appointed our first distributors in New Zealand with great success. We are opening a, an operation in Tasmania. We're expanding um, nationally within Australia, and we're just in the process of finalising negotiations with two more national distributors for Australia. So, yeah. Great. Um, and another question just came in from Uday, um, and um, we're wondering, isn't wool very expensive compared to plastic or other packaging um, materials? So the wool that we use in this product is waste wool. So it is the underbelly of the sheep. It's the parts that really have no commercial application. So what we've done is create an opportunity and that waste wool is um, comparatively, it, it compares that we're able to do that. We're, we're um, also doing a, a lot in the R&D space with looking, other, looking at blending other fibres with the wool but it's very cost competitive. It's very important for us that our product is cost competitive with polystyrene. Fantastic, great. Um, right, and one of your impact metrics is the amount of wool you diverted from landfill, right? So, um, so yeah. And that's created a new revenue stream for farmers. Like previously, th that would just lie around and go to landfill. So, um, you know, it's, it's very rewarding for the farmers. Particularly in Australia, they're very drought stricken. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, and we have another question from Magma. Is the waste wool taken as is, or is there any compensation given to the sheep farmer? So we pay the sheep farmer for the waste wool. So that's why I said we've generated new revenue. Mm. So previously, they were never paid for the waste wool. We buy that, it's salad, it's belted. Um, we have different variables that we can control within that. But yes, the, the sheep farmer is um, a, a big part of what we're doing. It's a big part of our social impact. Great. Um, it looks like we, we don't have any more further questions for Joanne. So thank you so much, Joanne, for your presentation. And please, everyone, check out Joanne's uh, virtual uh, booth uh, and learn more about planning um, packaging. Oh, actually, sorry, before we go, one more question. Does this go into the building um, HVAC? Does this um, go into the building at this HVAC? Stage, <laughs> at this stage, the focus of our business has been on the packaging sector with the growth of e-commerce. Um, certainly COVID has accelerated our growth as people have transitioned to online business. Um, at this stage, we are doing a lot of R&D and we will be launching a building product shortly. And we're also looking at cool room panelling because um, cool room panels have got polystyrene and they're very flammable. So we have a lot of exciting projects um, that you know, we're, we're developing at the moment. So that's part of the reason that we need to raise capital to accelerate our impact. Great. All right. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Joanne. So um, our next fellow um, who is uh, presenting today in the Female Founder Showcase um, on the same theme of preserving the planet is actually Chabet of Bright Green Renewable Energy from Kenya. Chabet, would you like to show your uh, presentation and start? Absolutely. Okay, is it clear? Yes, we can see it. Thank okay. you. So good morning, everybody. My name is Chabet, and I'm based off of Nairobi, Kenya. I'm the founder of Bright Green, and at Bright Green, we say we're cre we are creating life-saving fuel. Now, there's a big problem that is cutting across Africa. The way Africa cooks is expensive and very detrimental to the environment. You see, Africa uses very heavily wood and charcoal to prepare meals. About 900 million people are using this kind of fuel. And across the globe, there's an even bigger market of 3 billion people. Now, I want to highlight what is so dangerous to the environment about this and why it's not good for the families. First of all, it's very expensive, um, taking about 50% of each family's income just to buy the fuel to prepare a meal. Um, the second thing is that it's very poor quality because it burns with, uh, it doesn't have sufficient heat often to prepare the meals. And thirdly, it's very dangerous, releasing a lot of smoke into the environment and as well as into the homes of the families of the users. And lastly, which is my focus of this presentation today, is that it's very destructive to the forest. It takes about um, seven to 10 kilos of uh, firewood for a family to prepare one single meal. But what we're doing at Bright Green is we're changing all of that. We've created a fuel that solves these four problems that I've mentioned. That's affordable, that's saving families up to 50% of what they use on wood fuel. That's high quality, offering long burning times and very high heat. That is safer for them, reducing the smoke um, they're exposed to by up to 90%. And lastly, it's sustainable. So we produce our fuel from recycled farm waste fibers, which means that um, aside from using uh, wood to actually, few, to actually support um, our work, we are using recycled waste and that way we're um, saving the environment. Now, um, the market is huge. Across Africa, it's about 12 billion shillings for $12 billion um, for the wood and the fuel market and used by about 900 million people. We're starting our work in Kenya. Now, Kenya uses about 2 million tons. Uh, that's about 50% of our market. And it's used by both commercials to fuel um, uh, uh, commercial stoves and also in homes to, to fuel household stoves. Now, when we looked at what the problem was in this particular market and why the fuel was expensive and, and uh, detrimental to the environment, we found that our reliance, over-reliance on forest is what is causing um, the fuel to be more expensive. Poor production methods is causing the fuel to be very poor quality. And so our value proposition as a company was to really come in and switch that up. And how we are working at the moment is we partner with farmers and we take their fibers and then we use our proprietary technology in our factories uh, where we transform this waste to fuel. And then our distribution model is through last mile distribution companies that are data driven, but also working with women entrepreneurs on the ground to really push the product and also as ambassadors of the product. I want to play this short video um, just to show you what uh, the entire process looks like. I seem not to have my volume on. Um, So this is basically what our factory back in Kenya looks like, and this is what the work that we do is involved like. Um, sorry, there's no sound, so I think I'll just walk you through it. So this is basically a, an, our entire value chain, all the way from the farms to the factory to our customers. And at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to change 
uh, a need that is very important for our customers, but also one that is heavily reliant on the environment and very destructive. So, so far we have made uh, an incredible um, amount of impact. We have sold over 2 million units of our product, reaching over 10,000 homes, saving families over $200,000 and saving over 900 acres of farm. Our ask today is 320K to be able to scale up our impact even further into two uh, neighboring countries, Uganda and uh, Tanzania as well, and to really bring the immediate and effective impact that we're having. Thank you so much. We're open to, you know, to connect and please find our contacts on screen. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Shabet. Um, now we're ready for questions from the audience. So feel free to um, share any questions you might have in the comments box. Maybe Chibet, I could start with the first question to you. Um, how did you choose to, the two neighboring market um, that you have uh, targeted to expand into? Come in, I didn't quite hear you. Oh, I was wondering, how did you choose to, uh, the two neighboring markets that you targeted to um, expand to? Okay, absolutely. So the culture around Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, that's the East Africa's um, uh, region is very similar. So how our product is used in our country and how it will be used in the neighboring countries is very similar. And we have spotted almost exactly same, the same problem and the same need for our product. So for us, this is a low hanging fruit that we can re easily reach and easily impact. Mm -hmm. And is the current market that you're targeting more urban or rural? Okay. So at the moment, we serve two main markets. We are targeting urban areas because that's where um, charcoal, which is what we're directly targeting very heavily, um, is used. And in this market, there are two main players. There are commercials and there are also um, uh, uh, households. So we, we have... Um, we have structured the business and the distribution chain in such a way that we're serving both these markets. Mm -hmm. I see. And oh, we have a lot of questions around competition. It sounds like this is a space where there's a lot of players. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, the audience would really like to know sort of what sets you apart and how do you plan to compete with them? Okay. Absolutely. So COVID has been an interesting year for us. We actually have finally cracked what is um, our big, you know, differentiating factor from everybody else. So our fuel actually has a new feature, which we are currently in the process of launching, which is it is able to repel mosquitoes as, it, uh, as it's burning. So aside from just having the value proposition of, you know, environment and cost saving for the customers, we're now bringing in an entire new, you know, uh, value prop of a health benefit to them. And this is what's going to really differentiate us. And that's actually what uh, this round of funding is for, to really push this new, better version of our product into the market. Okay. Nobody um, else is doing that, by the way. This is, we are the first company to do that in the whole world. So we're really, really we're excited about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And is the market entry strategy for, um, for this segment of, of selling briquettes uh, very low? Um, and if so, how do you plan to keep um, the other briquettes providers, I guess, out of the market and, and, and sort of so that your uh, mosquito repellent briquettes have a better chance? Okay. So first of all, briquettes have been, you know, marketed as a, a very easy and low hanging business to kind of pull off, but that's not the case because um, competing with charcoal, first of all, is very difficult. The qualities that charcoal give in terms of the burn properties and the ability to, you know, give energy to the family is very high. So getting into the market and being able to produce a product that competes with that kind of, you know, uh, value that charcoal gives is very high. We have seen lots of micro enterprises come in, uh, in this space, but all of them, and I mean, most of them are actually dropping off because they're not able to give the value that charcoal gives. So what we're doing differently, if we have created a product that actually works better than charcoal that produces higher heat than charcoal so we're trying to mimic as close as possible to what the value charcoal gives and then you know go up, go above and beyond um, secondly i think we have been able to scale really quickly which has allowed us to bring our costs uh, very much lower than our competitors so at the moment we're producing at about 30 percent uh, less than what our competitors produce at which also gives us the opportunity to be able to you know sell our, our product at a, at a cheaper cost but in, instead of going that 
directly to the market. What we're also doing is partnering with last mile companies. So we've established ourselves as a manufacturing company. And then from there, our distributors are the ones who push the product. So our focus as a company is really to create the best value product. I see. Um, and what is the carbon emission of the Bright Greens product? Okay. So at the moment, we're still measuring what the carbon emission is, but we do have a smoke reduction of, of 90%, and we're looking at a potential 50 to 60% less carbon emission than what um, charcoal currently produces. And what our product does is we're able to really streamline and, and um, standardize what uh, the product that we're putting out as opposed to charcoal, which, you know, it depends on the tree, depends on how well it has been produced, that creates very varying carbon emissions. So that also allows us to really strategize and be able to plan what our long-term impact will be. I see. Okay. And maybe just one last question. Um, how do you collect the biomass and how much does that cost you as a proportion of the total cost? Okay. So first of all, our raw material cost for biomass is 5% of the whole product. Um, um, but how we collect is, so we have structured drone debt data maps of different farmers across the world, and uh, we have trained them to be able to produce uh, the raw material for us and package it in the standards that we require. So we do have an entire team on the ground who trains the farmers on what our raw material looks like, and then from there, the raw material is then transported to us using our own means. So the farmer's work is really just to get the raw material to the, the level that we want it, and then we go in and bring it. Oh, fantastic. Great. Well, we'll run out of time for this Q&A segment, but uh, Chibet, if you can answer some of the uh, questions that has come up um, in the comment box directly so that uh, they could have some response, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Great. Well, our third speaker is Kristen uh, from India on Sathipad. Kristen, do you want to share your presentation? Perfect. Hopefully you can see it now. Um, hi everyone, I'm Kristen, one of the co-founders of Sati, and we make biodegradable and compostable sanitary pads that are good for the body, community, and environment. I'm a New Yorker that ended up in Ahmedabad to start Sati with my co-founder, Tho, uh, who has experience in manufacturing and textiles. We both studied mechanical engineering and found a passion for solving issues that would positively impact people. In college, I went to um, India for the first time with the uh, MIT D-Lab and worked on my first sustainable product. It was then that I knew I wanted to come back to India to make a positive change. At Sati, we're addressing three major issues. Meet Komo from Ahmedabad. She was using conventional pads and for years she'd been suffering from rashes and UTIs. Almost 60% of women experience UTIs in their lifetime. Meet Lalita Devi from a small village in Jharkhand. She suffered from reproductive tract infections because of lack of access to pads. Only 18% of women in India have access to sanitary pads, and this also impacts their ability to go to school and work. And finally, our land and ocean are suffering because of conventional pads uh, containing 90% plastic and taking 600 to 700 years to degrade. We address these issues in a holistic way by um, providing a rash and chemical free experience that's accessible to all and doesn't harm the environment as the pads are 100% biodegradable and compostable. We've developed a patented technology that converts natural fiber into um, absorbent materials, which then enable us to make not only sanitary pads, but other products as well. Our business is simple. We source banana and bamboo fiber from farmers, which we use to process our pads in our factory and then distribute them to women in urban and rural areas with various distribution methods. We have an innovative cradle-to-cradle -cradle product and business model that integrates all of our impacts into the supply chain so that as we grow, our impacts grow. We address eight of the UN SDGs and measure five metrics. We increase an in income to the land of farmers, the number of women we employ in our all-women manufacturing unit, the number of women we reach in both urban and rural areas, and the reduction of plastic waste and CO2 emissions because our pads can be upcycled into compost, biogas, and electricity. We've been recognized globally by Time Magazine, uh, UN Environment, UNIDO, Friday Women's Initiative Awards, and many more for our powerful blend of proprietary technology, innovation, social good, and circularity. But our favorite recognition comes from our customers. And here are a few of their reviews. 
We're ready to scale and we've already developed and launched our product. We're generating revenue. Uh, our pat patent was gra granted and we have a, sp a strong supply chain and high value LOIs. We're currently raising uh, 5 million and, um, to meet demand and scale. We aim to revolutionize the hygiene industry as a consumer products company that makes products that are good for your body, the community, and the environment in a sustainable and responsible way. We want to drive systemic change around how menstrual hygiene is addressed and thus drive the shift to a circular economy. That means making sanitary pads that are made from sustainable, renewable materials, making them accessible to women no matter where they live, and working with other partners to make sure our products get upcycled. We're ready to scale, and there are multiple ways that you can be part of the movement. If you're an investor, we're raising our seed round. If you're a corporate, partner with us for CSR programs or to collaborate on reducing uh, your plastic or carbon footprint. Or you can help us amplify Southeast Voice on social media and help us spread more awareness about periods, sustainability, and climate change. We're doing our part to preserve the planet by building a new model for manufacturing that incorporates social and environmental impacts into our business. But to be part of the systemic change, you don't need to build a company. You can also start with changes in your daily routine by reducing overconsumption and trying composting. These are just some of the women that we've worked with to date and we aim to make that millions more in the next few years. We hope you'll join us. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Um, great, let's see what questions come in for Kristen. Ah, here we go. Um, oh, this question is actually for Tibet. So let's see uh, if we have any further questions that will come in. Um, yeah. So Kristen, where are your uh, primary customers at the moment? Um, is it based in India or globally? Yeah, we our primary um, customer base is in India right now. So mm -hmm. we sell online on our website, and we also um, sell through various distributors, so eco stores and things like that. Um, but we just uh, actually made a deal with a distributor in Indonesia, so Ooh. it will be available uh, starting in December. Great. Um, all right, here here we go. We have some questions from uh, Sagar. How do you differentiate yourself from other products and what is the moat? And what is that? Uh, I, I think it's your key value proposition and, and you know, oh. um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so our key value proposition is that um, basically we're, one, one part is that we have a technology that converts the agri-waste uh, materials into an absorbent material. This allows us to make not only sanitary pads, but other products as well. Mm -hmm. And the other part is also that we have this um, business model that incorporates all of the different kind of, uh, aspects of impact. So um, we developed our kind of ethical supply chain and everything and, and really built up this supply chain over the last five years. Okay. And what is the outer layer of the pad made of? Yeah, so that um, we replaced every single layer had like regular conventional pads with uh, compostable, certified compostable materials. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how we've been able to develop the product. I see. Okay. And you, uh, you had mentioned you're raising uh, 5 million in seed funding. What are you planning to use the funds for? Yeah, so in terms of fundraising right now, we've already um, We've already secured a number of LOIs, which uh, shows the demand for the product. But in order to uh, kind of convert that to the next level, we need to invest in equipment. So um, half of the five million will go towards setting up our new facility and new um, machinery, and then the other half is more on the operations, uh, marketing, and um, uh, development side. Okay, and what about the cost comparison with other uh, pads? Um, how much is the Sahi pad versus like an average price uh, competitor and, and how do you reach the lower income consumers? Yeah, there's two main groups of products. So the regular kind of conventional pads and then these alternative brands. And so alternative brands might have some um, additives in the product and things like that. And so conventional pads are somewhere between 
12 and 18 rupees per pad, and the alternative brands are more like 35 to 55 rupees. And so our product is much closer. It's around 20, 22 rupees per pad. Uh, so we're trying to make, make sure it's as uh, close to regular um, conventional products as, um, as you can make it, but then still being, uh, providing all the other benefits. I see. And we also have a two-pound um, uh, uh, scheme in terms of delivering both to urban and rural areas. So with rural areas, we're working with NGOs, and so the urban sales are subsidizing the sales in rural areas. Okay, oh, fantastic. Um, let's see, I think out the outer layer of the pad. And how do you measure your KPIs and how many women uh, how do you know how many women experience periods without rashes as a result of your product? Yeah, so uh, women are giving us feedback on our products very often in terms of um, just sending us uh, emails and messages and things like that. But we also do ask for feedback regularly. Um, and then in terms of measuring it in rural areas, we've been doing surveys uh, in order to understand a little bit more about the uh, experience and how it differs from um, from women that are living in urban areas. Great. Um, and last but not least, we have one more question. Um, do you also provide incinerating solutions to dispose the use pads for corporates and schools? Uh, so we don't encourage incineration as much. Mm -hmm. We're looking more at other models for um, the composting, like even if it's an uh, anaerobic uh, composting, that's um, better than incineration because incineration is still burning uh, the product which will release carbon. So we're looking at anaerobic composting and it's, which are still uh, community levels so they're, they're much, uh, it can take much higher volumes. Mm -hmm. I see. Great. We're well, definitely open to kind of working together on that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we have run out of time for the session, but there's still a few more questions in the question box. So, Kristen, if we could trouble you to answer them directly on the chat, um, and then we can move on to our next fellow. Um, so, the next segment. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Uh, the next segment is around saving lives, the themes of saving lives. And so, the first fellow who will be presenting is um, a Life Bank of Nigeria. And Timmy, who's our fellow, is actually unavailable today. And so as a result, um, uh, and Anique is going to present um, a Life Bank's work in Nigeria. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, Timmy Biwa is the CEO and founder of Life Bank. She's unavoidably absent today, so I'll be taking her stead. My name is Adini Kesanusi. I work as the finance lead at Life Bank. Um, I don't know, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay, um, so Life Bank, we would like to describe ourselves as um, we are in the business of saving lives. Life Bank is a medical distribution company. We provide essential um, critical supplies to hospital workers at the right time and in the right condition. The problem, usually, the problem is that um, health workers find it difficult to find critical supplies when they need it at the right time and in the right condition. We have provided um, solutions to this and would like to call this solution, we call this solution the four days. Uh, first, we discover, we gather inventory data from our vendors. We discover this, um, this inventory using um, our desktop, through desktop search using um, our ussd platform and we also have a 24-hour call center where hospitals can call and they can inquire and place orders for critical supplies they need we also deliver to these busy health workers through various channels we use bikes we use drones we use um, boats and we use truck we are not um we are not specific um, we use um delivery means that is that suits the situation 
We also have a donor app where we control supply. We ensure that um, donors donate regularly through the app by sending them reminders and, and, and frequent updates on when to, do, to donate routinely. A business model, we charge on a sliding scale. Um, the average price for blood is about $46, and for oxygen, we charge about $38. We have four pricing cadres. Um, the majority of our subscribers are on the silver cadre, which accounts for about 76% of our current users. Um, attraction. We've earned over $800,000 we've earned over eight hundred thousand dollars in revenue. Um, we've witnessed significant increase in revenue year on year from inception till date. Um, we had also we've also moved over over to twenty seven thousand units of products. We've served over seven um, over over seven hundred and forty hospitals in Nigeria and in Kenya. We are now profitable in our current um, in Lagos. We saved over thirteen thousand lives, and our annual growth rate annual annual revenue growth rate from twenty from twenty nineteen to to 2020 is about 42 percent. We also have a 24-hour call center and we deliver in on that 35 minutes. Our acts, we are, we are looking to raise six million dollars. We already had um, a commitment of three million from DFC. We recently closed our MSD grant round and we are looking to raise one million dollars in equity. We, we would be using this fund to fully automate our fulfillment process, to grow in our existing markets, and to expand to new markets. With this growth, we'll create jobs, we'll create significant impact and increase revenue. Um, you can see our details, our contact details. Thank you. Thank you, Endemic. Great, now we can move on to Q&A for uh, Life Bank. Maybe um, I will ask you the first question, Anamik. You had mentioned that you're looking to expand to new markets. Can you share with us which are the new markets you're hoping to expand to after this round of raise? We are currently in Nigeria and Kenya, like I mentioned earlier. We are looking to go to Ethiopia. We are going to uh, Ethiopia, Ghana, and... Dakar in the next couple of months. Great. And how did you select those markets specifically to expand into? For Ghana, it's we have is a neighboring country to Nigeria. We have mm -hmm. like almost the same system that works. Um, Ethiopia, we already have our drone. We have a we already have our drone operation in Ethiopia. We had done a sketch project on drone sometime last year. Mm -hmm. So we had seen that it's a viable city and we're looking to go there too. I see. Okay. And, and do you already have um, impact metrics of since Live Bank has been in um, since inception? What, um, the, like the number of lives saved and et cetera? That yes. You can share with us? Yeah. Yes, we have. So if you look at my slide, usually attract. Action. Usually, we measure our impact by the number of life saved mm -hmm. and the number of donors. So we had saved over that from inception till date, and we've moved over twenty-seven thousand units, basically. And we have a donor pla donor app that has over five thousand donors at the moment. We are looking to grow. We the plan is to get to one million donors in the next ten years. Yeah. Voluntary donors, unpaid donors. Great. Um, can you share? Um, we have a question about how the gender narrative has been incorporated into your team's operations. Sorry, can you come again with that question? I really didn't ah, get that. Sure. The question is how has the gender narrative been incorporated into your team's operation? Okay, thank you. Absolutely. That um, we the major um, users of blood are women when about 70 percent of over 70 percent of the orders we take and we fulfill are 
women who are who just had the baby and they need blood because they are bleeding profusely. So we ensure that a large um, so with with this we are then we we have been able to like save lives, especially women life during childbirth. I can I don't our video is there's an ex, uh, on our exhibition you will see a video a typical video that tells the true life bank story. I see. Yeah, it's about okay. a woman that just had a baby. She was bleeding and the health worker called us and were able to deliver within the time frame and we were able to save her life basically and restore joy to the family. That's great. Um, okay, our next question is how big is the market in terms of revenue and growth potential? So we would, um, the market is, we cross, so we like to say that we cross, uh, uh, we cut across three major markets, the logistic mm -hmm. market, the technology, and healthcare, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Um, because we deliver, we are in, it, it's estimated to, it, to be about $28 billion in Africa, this market. Mm -hmm. Okay, $28 billion, okay. And, um, and, and can you mention again your revenue model? How do, how do you make money um, um, in this market? Okay, so we charge an average of $8 per unit moved. Mm -hmm. Eight dollars per unit moved. Okay, great. Um, and do you have tailor-made solutions for different kind of critical deliveries? And can you describe some examples? Okay, um, so a typical so hospitals, like I mentioned earlier, we charge on a on a on a sliding scale. So we mm -hmm. understand that some hospitals serve um, serve underserved people, um, and they won't be able to afford a lot, a lot, they won't be able to pay a lot of money. So we charge, we charge an average of about $3 for those kind of hospitals. Then the hospital that serve the rich pay more. They pay an average of about $20, $20. So when we gross that up and we divide it on the average, it comes to about $8 per hospital. I see. I see. Here. Yeah. So, so these are, um, I guess, different pricing points yes. for different segments of clients. Um, yes. And, and what about um, uh, so tailor-made solutions for different kinds of critical deliveries? Can you provide mm. some examples around that? Okay. So for um, for blood, if you like, I said we deliver through various channels. So for tr um for Blood, if you're in the riverine area, like we have a riverine community in Lagos, Nigeria, and we mm -hmm. deliver to them using boats. Um, for um, oxygen, we deliver using trucks and sometimes mini trucks. We call that tricycle in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're mini trucks. So we design. So Uh, depending on where you are. My name is Melissa and I'm the founder of Asafia. We are an affordable care come operate in Nairobi, Kenya, that gets disruptively low cost healthcare to low income patients. Around half of healthcare spending in Kenya and places like Kenya are, is happening out of pocket. Meaning that people living in informal settlements like Mukuru, which is pictured in this, this photograph, are using their, their hard earned money, are largely uninsured, and are going to clinics and chemists like the one that, that you see. This actually creates a $12 billion market opportunity just in providing healthcare for the poor in places like Kenya across Africa. 
So um, if you are living in, in the informal settlements in Kenya, it's actually incredibly difficult to access reliable and effective healthcare. Healthcare is largely unavailable. We have few physicians for a population of over 50 million people. Healthcare is largely unaffordable. The majority of the country is uninsured and an average, the cost of using an average private sector clinic costs over three days of, of wages um, for, for somebody who's living in, in poverty. And finally, and probably worse, it's, it's largely ineffective. So if you're, if you're low income and using a public sector hospital, you'll only find the drugs you need about half the time. And even across private sector clinics, the, the effectiveness of the care, the adherence to evidence-based protocols is only being measured at about 40%. Access Afia has created affordable, effective, and convenient primary health care through a network of tech-enabled be like CVS Minute Clinics in, in a U.S. context, for example. They are able to be a one-stop shop and be providing digital and rapid diagnostics on site, over 400 products from prescription medication to, to health and hygiene, um, as, as, as shown in this picture, and, and also has consultations with qualified Kenyan clinical officers who are supported by um, digital workflows as, as they deal with patients. Um, secondly, um, we're able to then extend the service that we give patients in our clinic um, beyond the clinic through our virtual care app called MDoctari. MDoctari lets our diabetes and hypertension patients engage in coaching sessions with us between their clinic visits. It allows them to ask questions before they actually come into clinics and allows us to broader extend our geographic reach to people who don't necessarily live in, in the settlements where our physical presence is. The model for us is working. We've received, we've received multiple accolades. We're one of the highest rated primary health care providers in the entire country. Um, we have been able to achieve a stock availability of over 99%. We have a cost, a price point that's about 300% cheaper than surrounding clinics, um, competitive options in, in our market. And, and most importantly to me, over 98% of the patients that we talked to last month told us that they felt better within three days of a visit. We're currently working on building out our SaaS and analytics offering. We acquired a franchise business this year and are beginning to package up the Access Afia Magic and the Access Afia model and distribute it through a franchise model. Um, we're also investing in and growing our virtual care offering, which is incredibly important as patients want to stay home and we want to work to, to flatten the curve. We've raised about two. $0.7 million from investors to date. We currently have an open bridge round with about a million closed, and we're continuing to keep that open for the rest of the year with the target of bringing in another $250,000. Um, and that is really going to, to, again, building out our franchise offering and then also building out the MDoctari virtual clinic. I started this company eight years ago because I thought it was wrong that about $12 billion was being spent every single year on healthcare by some of the most vulnerable populations and largely on healthcare that didn't quite work for them. We now are a team of over 60 people living in Nairobi. Uh, we've learned a lot, we've changed, we've pivoted our model and we're ready to grow now. So I look forward to talking with any of you watching or on or after this, this call about how to do that. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Melissa. So we're just gonna wait a moment uh, for the questions to come in. <laughs> so I, I think I saw in your earlier slide that you, you started the business in 2012. So now, now you're eight years old, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. We oh. opened our, our first clinic in, in 2012, uh, which is actually right where that picture is. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, and you're a Delaware uh, B Corp. Wow. Yeah, so we have a dual structure. Um, the, the parent company is a benefit corporation with, with a statement of public benefit to create healthcare models primarily for, but not exclusively for, uh, underserved populations. Mm -hmm. And then that 
100% owns Access Afia Kenya, which is our, our operating company. I see, I see. Okay, great. Um, and how many clinic actually do you have currently? So we have 15, 10 of them are structured as branches. They operate in Nairobi in informal settlements and five of them are structured as part of our franchise network, mm -hmm. which is in uh, additional counties outside of Nairobi. I see, okay. And with this next round of funding, you, uh, um, what, is the, what are you planning in terms of use of funds? So the, the majority of the funds um, were raised earlier this year and really our focus this year and early next year is on developing the franchise offering. So this yeah. is a pivot of our business from focusing on owning branches fully to actually mm -hmm. having the franchisee be our new customer. So, mm -hmm. so we are just boxing up elements of, of what we do and what really works in the branches and making that easy for, for other people to use to run their clinics. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have some, some metrics around, around that that we're focused on in terms of franchisee sustainability, revenue, and, and satisfaction. Um, and then the second big focus is on MDoctari. So this mm -hmm. is a virtual care platform. Um, we started it to make sure that it would actually serve populations such as the ones that, that Access Office is primarily serving, although uh, the nature of the digital app is anybody can use it, no matter where they, yeah. they live or what their income level is. So we've been building out um, important features uh, such as on-demand consultations, so allowing you to just press talk to a doctor now instead of scheduling a future visit. We've also been building out USSD to make it more broadly accessible to, to our market. Um, so, so we're continuing to focus on that for the rest of this year, but also the first two quarters of next, um, after which we would then be looking to, to go out and raise a, a Series A to, to, more, uh, to further grow those two models. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, terrific. And so we have a question. How is AXA, uh, your company working with the government of Kenya and other partners? So uh, on, a, on, a, on a number of ways. So we work with the government kind of end to end to actually run a clinic. You know, we talk to them before we start it to talk about where there's gaps in health access. We work with them uh, on a monthly basis in terms of reporting in data and distributing uh, high impact products like vaccines and family planning products at a, at a pretty extreme subsidy onwards to patients, which comes through government uh, supply chains. So there's a lot of just operational work that we do with government. We're of course really interested in being a more strategic player in, in universal health coverage in Kenya um, in terms of how we can actually structure more outcomes-based uh, uh, partnerships using our clinics, although that is still a conversation uh, um, we're having. In terms of some of our other key partners, um, we've been working a lot with interesting uh, diagnostics and device partners. So we have a really interesting partnership with, with Butterfly, who makes a very lightweight point of care ultrasound device, and, and we're working on rolling that out across all 15 of our clinics so that one central sonographer can be using a telemedicine module to guide um, clinicians in all of Access Afia's clinics. And, and actually do diagnosis. This is able to help us reduce the cost of ultrasound in informal settlements by 50%, while also increasing access and, and uptime by having this always on model. Um, we, we uh, of course, the, the new sort of type of partner we're focused on is health financing. We're working with a couple of, of micro insurance companies here to help provide financing options for, for our patients who have been largely uninsured through NHIF, the government's healthcare scheme, which is largely tied to your employment. And we continue to look at, at lining up more financing partners uh, next year um, to, to get all of our patients under, under coverage. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you, Melissa. Well, uh, that's all the time we have today for questions. There's two more additional questions that came in after as you were speaking. So if I could trouble you to answer them on the comments box, that would be great. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to the third theme. Thank you, Melissa, <laughs> of breaking down barriers. And our first speaker is Carmina of InvestEd in Philippines. Carmina. Hi. Hello. You guys see it? Okay. So hi everyone, I'm Carmina, CEO of Invested. All right. Meet Ericsson and his family. So um, due to their limited, even if they had limited funds, um, they pushed for Ericsson to get his psychology degree last year because 76% of employers in the Philippines still do require a college degree. 
So post grad, Ericsson got a job um, in sales. The pay was okay, just enough to live, but not enough to be financially secure. So as a high potential dreamer, Ericsson had this huge desire to lead a better life. And he knew that if he didn't become more, his life would be just that, surviving but not really progressing. Erickson's case cannot be more true than it is today as we're facing a pandemic, a recession, and the fourth industrial revolution. So job markets have never been more competitive and econom economies have never been more unstable. So because of that, Erickson decided to start his own business and he put up a mini convenience store near his home. And he was just right to do that because when the pandemic hit, um, instead of being unemployed, Ericsson is someone who is financially secure today because people flocked to his store as the lockdown started. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for 30 million other dreamers in the country who don't have money to get a college degree and invest in upskilling themselves to compete in today's world. So in fact, Ericsson would have been part of this statistic if it weren't for the fact that he found invested. So Ericsson has actually gotten a total of three loans from Invested, um, which is the company that I founded. Um, so the first loan we gave him so he could finish his college degree. We gave Ericsson the capital when his only collateral was his potential. And when the, when the COVID-19 lockdown started, we gave, an, we gave him an emergency loan when he couldn't go to work because of transportation lockdowns. And when he wanted to become more, specifically an entrepreneur, we gave him the capital to start and scale his business. So his monthly income increased from $1,000 to $5,000 in less than a year. This is our mission at Invested, to help people like Ericsson or high potential dreamers achieve prosperity in a data-driven and post-pandemic world. And we want to do this by being Asia's leading financial institution for human development. So, Financial inclusion has continued to elude um, emerging and developing markets such as the Philippines. And one of the main reasons is the fact that a huge segment of the population is still excluded from financial services. Specifically, people like Ericsson, who are of legal age, um, who is a student, and you know, young adults who financial institutions still deem as untouchable and risky and unprofitable. But as with Ericsson's case at Invested, we see this market as a high growth and high potential market, as long as risk can be predicted and managed. So what we're developing is a risk engine for education finance, which is powered by a human development AI that can predict a young person's education to adulthood journey. And this allows the lender, like Invested, to maximize profit and also maximize customer value. So it's key features is a high potential dreamer score, which can predict um, probability of profitability. We have the pay it forward score, which predicts behavior in the next payment. Will they overpay? Will they pay exactly? And which day will they pay? We also have a life risk score, which measures a person's propensity to any risk in that education to adulthood journey, such as teenage pregnancy, not being able to get a job fast, and so on. So we have a series of financial products for traditional and non-traditional dreamers. And exclusive to our borrowers, we also have lifelong dreamer loans for those who want to continuously progress in life. So we're innovating the traditional balance sheet model. We source loan capital from a few um, big lenders, and we take on the risk on our balance sheet. And we earn via loan interest and service fees. So we, we are currently the leading student loan company in the Philippines. And in fact, one of the big banks here, Union Bank, has made us their student loan arm due to our proprietary risk engine. So we are projecting a hockey stick growth in the next five years as part of our path to become Asia's first human development neobank. So um, we have a billion dollar market with a path to a regional monopoly being one of the first movers in subprime education financing in Asia. Our business model is pandemic and recession tested. We have exponential returns um, to offer funders, specifically an exit also via IPO or m and And our IP is novel and patentable. And of course, we have high integrity and globally awarded um, team and institution audited by some of the top audit, audit firms in the country. 
So we have a rockstar team also, a mix of young and uh, young people, mission-driven people, and also really experienced multidisciplinary um, advisors on our board. So with that, we invite everyone to join the Invested Impact community. We are open to investors right now. Um, I will not be able to disclose the details though, but do contact me via LinkedIn. Here's my QR code or my colleague, Melissa. So thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you, Carmina. Very exciting. It's so, so amazing to see how your business has evolved since we, we have evolved. <laughs> Great. Well, so now we're open to the Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions for Carmina, please feel free. Hello. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? I'm sorry. I think I've yeah, I I just for a bit. One moment. Sorry. Um, so our first question is: What kind of variables does your risk model use? Um, we use a ton of data points, but um, I mean, this is a typical I get well, with regards to our credit scoring um, model, right? Um, so with Invested, we are using um, you know the typical data points that people use to develop credit scores. This could be credit bureau data, um, demographic data, loan application form data. Um, you know, and of course, the borrower's data as they enter our student loan program. However, what makes our High Potential Dreamer score and Paid Forward score unique is that we have a unique data set that is generated by us only that our competitors um, will never have access to. So at Invested, we have a success platform, which is basically a digital coaching program. Um, each of our borrower is assigned a digital coach and they may access learning materials which, um, on our platform, which has, you know, back-end analytics. So from there, we're able to generate really quality and rich education to adulthood. Sorry, I, I invented this word. <laughs> um, the typical word in the industry is education to employment. But um, <laughs> I, um, what we do um, at Invested as a human development financial institution is do loans from education to pre-retirement, um, you know, that sort of vision. So we generate a unique data set from education to adulthood, um, which is very rich um, in depth to the student's life. Um, you know, we look at things such as if the student's family meets regularly about their finances over dinner, are they better payers? Um, you know, if a student, um, you know, has dropped out, uh, some of the things we found out is like, um, for financial institutions, they'd actually deem someone who dropped out a lot already as, you know, financially risky. But are the are analytics actually say that, you know, these people are actually better payers because, you know, they tend out they tend to be more resilient. So we look at all kinds of data um, like that. And yeah, what something special is that we have our unique data set that sets us apart. All right. And how do borrowers know about your company? Do you advertise in educational institutions or you have, um, yeah, what is your uh, customer acquisition strategy, I suppose? Exactly. So um, our main customer acquisition, um, well, we have various channels, um, digital, non-digital, um, but what we really like to do is set up strategic partnerships. Yes, we do have um, partnerships with educational institutions, um, in fact, right now, um, you know, demand for partnership with us is skyrocketing due to the pandemic. Um, we, but students mainly find us, um, so earlier on, I showed different um, product lines, right? So for the traditional dreamers, those getting, you know, their college degrees, typically it's, um, we've gone a bit viral with every school we've entered. It's mostly referrals from peers. Um, and uh, referrals as an acquisition channel is very important, especially in a culture in the Philippines where loans are just perceived so negatively. So um, uh, a lot of our um, customers refer us a lot. We have a 72% referral rate without any incentive, simply because um, our borrowers receive such positive um, impact on their lives when they use our product. And then, yeah, we also have the B2B um, channel, which is either by schools or with our partnership with institutions like Union Bank, wherein all of the schools that bank with them, um, they refer us, 
you know, as a financing partner, specifically for education um, loans. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, it seems like we have run out of time. So thank you so much, Carmina, for your presentation and the Q&A. There's a few, oh, a, a few questions just popped up. So if I could trouble you to answer them on the chat, that would be great. Thank you, Carmina. Thank Our you. next speaker is Sophie from Hive Online in Denmark. Sophie, please take it away. <laughs> Thanks very much, Wendy. So we all know it's tough building a business. But imagine how much harder it is for Farida. She can't read and has never had a bank account, but for her running a business is a matter of survival. She needs a peanut processing machine to grow her business, but can't borrow $200 without credit history. Mohamedou runs a successful microfinance business, but Farida is invisible to him. And transporting cash to the villages is expensive. Millions of Faridas are making Africa the fastest growing small business market, and Mohamedou is desperate to reach them. I grew up with so many advantages. I can read, I have healthcare, and I take technology for granted. But when I ran my first business, I couldn't build out my reputation fast enough and ended up losing everything. Then I had a career building technology and businesses for global banks, including in African countries. I saw firsthand how difficult it is for banks to reach businesses in rural Africa and how standard financial products don't meet their needs. I learned a lot about finance and saw how today's economy is stacked against entrepreneurs and especially women like Farida. So I decided to flip the odds and use my experience to give micro businesses access to the credit in new markets they deserve. 450 million small and family businesses make up over half the world's economy, but they don't have the opportunities that big businesses get for credit markets. They can't build trust to grow their businesses. Most of them fail. And that problem just got worse with COVID, with contracting markets. It's a universal problem, but trust is an even bigger problem in developing economies. In World Bank's Human Development Index, most of the least developed countries are in Africa, and Niger and Mozambique are two of the lowest. Savings groups have helped Farida save for financial stability, but all the transactions are in cash, so they can't build credit history. Hive Online builds the bridge between formal institutions and informal entrepreneurs with a distributed community finance solution that digitizes trust. Businesses build trust by delivering what they've agreed based on relationships made through the trust we've helped them build. Trust is built on facts about what they do as they agree, deliver and transact. Our analytics measure commitments made met and we build a digital reputation to show how reliable they are based on what they do. Structured loans incentivize sustainable behaviors and we aggregate risk so communities can leverage collective muscle. It's built on a stable coin on the Stella blockchain so communities can build wealth without reliance on a bank, but built for very low data and very low literacy. We built our savings group solution for Niger, sponsored by Global NGO Care, partnering with Mohamedou and helping Farida build trust so she can buy her machine and make enough money to send her girls to school. Over in Mozambique, Anna's a bit better off but still can't access formal finance. Anna bought her fishing boat with a loan from her savings group so she can supplement the income from her small farm, but she can't afford crop care or better equipment for her boat. We're working with an NGO and the local cooperatives association to help Anna's community build financial resilience. The savings group product and the co-op product share common services, making it easy to scale. We're currently building the rails through sponsored projects with our NGO partners, reaching communities to demonstrate impact. Then we integrate the formal lenders who become our primary revenue stream by paying us commission on lending to the communities. Finally, we register as a mobile money provider, adding transaction fees as a further revenue stream, enabling our communities to build wealth without the need for banks. Beyond our NGO partnerships, we're building relationships with commercial and government organizations who all need access to the data and analytics that form the core of our platform. Trust builds business relationships. Hive Online builds trust as we're proving in the least developed countries in the world. Our backgrounds are key to what we do. As well as building global banks, I've written books on organizations, fintech and economics, and I've been named one of the top 10 most influential women in crypto. I've built a strong inclusive team with over a century of experience in finance, technology and research. From commercial banking, the World Bank, the Economist Intelligence Unit and NGOs, and elite developers from Kigali's Carnegie Mellon University. We made over half a million euros last year, and we're ready to scale because of accelerating customer demand. So we're raising 1.2 million euros to grow the team and get our product out faster. 
We're looking for impact focused investors who can help us through our rapid market expansion. And we also want to build more partnerships with African telcos and financial institutions and agricultural buyers. We're moving to Nigeria next, then Kenya and Zambia in, in our next, next three months. So if that's you and you're one of those partners, we'd love it if you would join us and help these ladies build a sustainable business ecosystem of tomorrow. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you. Um, so now if anyone has any questions for Sophie and Hype online, please uh, type them in the chat box. Um, yeah, maybe we should just ask you, uh, how, how you said uh, the next market is Nigeria, how come? <laughs> Um, so this is with um, Mercy Corps in northern Nigeria. They're working with um, communities of returning refugees, mm -hmm. um, helping them to become farmers um, and working through savings groups. So this is a combination of our cooperative product and our, and our savings group product where we, um, we help the ladies get access to, um, to, to agricultural inputs at times when obviously the cash flow is, is weak because of the, the farming bumpy cash flow life cycle. Um, so underpinning the platform is the same reputation, the same financial products, um, and of course the same wallets, um, regardless of what sort of group you're in. Um, so this means that we can expand into Nigeria, um, where we hope to be working with four, um, four commercial banks there as well. Oh, great. Um, and you actually just mentioned about, um, you know, agricultural um, uh, women who are working in the agricultural space. Is there any uh, actually other industry specifically among all of your other um, uh, constituents that that you know, that's a key theme in your business or you're actually industry agnostic in your so we, we're primarily in agricultural markets because we're rural and obviously most mm -hmm. of rural Africa is, is agricultural, but um, the ladies in Niger um, are also producing goods such as cosmetics and food products, um, often based on agricultural outputs. Um, so cottage industries of all types, as well as um, agricultural. And then of course in the agricultural supply chain, um, there are other um, processes and other, other actors who are not primary producers, so yes. I see, okay. And, um, oh, here's a question for you, Sophie. How do you plan to scale up? Um, so at the moment, we're addressing our market through our NGO partnerships, um, which gives us access to hundreds of thousands of customers. Um, and as we progress, we're building more partnerships with uh, financial services providers, agricultural middlemen, um, and buyers um, who have a much longer term interest. We're also working, as, as I mentioned, with the Cooperative Association in Mozambique, Mm -hmm. um, and our strategy is to transition um, more towards these kind of bodies because they have a much longer term interest in the communities we're supporting. Um, and then eventually we're planning to go B2C. Oh, great. Um, and our next question is uh, from Agnes. Um, three countries in three months is quite an ambitious goal. Is there a reason why you've decided to go all three? And what does that mean for your business in terms of resources, funding and infrastructure? Yeah, this is a good question. It's based on market demand. Um, we built the platform to be very scalable. Um, since I've built five core banking systems in the past, I understand how to build scalable uh, financial systems. Um, and really, the, the only changes we have to make are cosmetic on, um, on the interface. Um, and then the, the big challenge is integrating with the local financial system. And we'll do that in a staged um, rollout. So we can roll out the accounting platform without having full integration with the financial system. And then we integrate as we go along. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. But that's also why we're raising money, because we need more people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> yes. And that will help with the growth. Um, okay, terrific. Well, it looks like we um, don't have any further questions. So please feel, feel free to visit Sophie's uh, Hive Online virtual booth so you can learn more about Hive Online and her work. Um, our much. next, thank you so much, Sophie. Our next speaker is Fancola. And Fancola is the founder of DIY Law in Nigeria. Fancola, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I had my virtual background on and that's just, that's just vanished, but that's okay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Fonkala Dele and I'm co-founder of DIY Law. Sorry, um, I don't think my, my um, screen is being shared. Um, I'm sorry. 
Uh, hey, I think it's working now. Perfect. Okay. okay. Sorry, is the timer resetting? Anyway, I'll go ahead. Hello, my name is Funkala Dele, and I'm a co-founder of DIY Law. At DIY Law, we're building the one-stop platform for automated legal and business support services in Africa. This picture, unfortunately, is not one of young Nigerians enjoying a football game. Um, it's a picture of a test center in Nigeria, and there were several of this in March 2016, sorry, in March 2014 where almost 7 million young Nigerians turned up for job interviews at the immigration service, um, just to fill 4,000 positions. Unfortunately, it didn't end well as there were deaths and casualties and the exercise was canceled altogether. With unemployment at an alarming rate in Nigeria, more and more people are turning, into, to, are turning to entrepreneurship every day. And even when they take themselves out of the unemployment equation by creating jobs for themselves, they're faced with new challenges challenges on how to register their businesses, how to protect their intellectual property, access to finance, onboarding their first employees, and just generally how to scale and compete with their peers globally. The legal and business support services markets in Nigeria is fragmented and manual, and an entrepreneur has to visit multiple government agencies, as well as engage multiple professional parties to be able to get their businesses up and running protect their intellectual property and just um, carry on business as normal. This can be exhausting, distracting and expensive. At DIY Law, we've taken our um, experiences to solve this problem and we've combined our expertise in legal, finance, business administration and project management with technology to be able to provide a simple, accessible and affordable solution for legal and business support services. We have an automated, intuitive, and simplistic platform where an entrepreneur can register their, business, um, their businesses and other business-related registra registrations. They can um, download automatic documents as well as um, engage professional parties on our Engage platform. We also have DIY resources where we provide free legal and business support service information for entrepreneurs. At the moment, we're currently developing DIY Business Box as the automated back office of African entrepreneurs. We have first mover advantage and we've gained brand recognition and brand equity over the years. We have also been able to collate useful data and that puts us in a good position to be able to scale our services to other countries in Africa. But at the moment, we're deepening our verticals in Nigeria. Our business model is predicated on um, large numbers and volumes. And at the moment, we serve B2C, which is working with entrepreneurs directly, as well as B2B2C, where we work with government agencies, financial institutions, incubators and accelerators to be able to access more clusters of entrepreneurs. Our transaction fees at the moment are one off, but we're building a subscription model for our month and month products. Um, at the moment, we have supported um, over 10,000, uh, we've provided over 10,000 legal services and supported over 100,000, 130,000 entrepreneurs. These entrepreneurs have gone on to create over 125,000 jobs in Nigeria. If, like my co-founders and I, you're passionate about entrepreneurship and how we can use it to solve the socioeconomic problems in Africa, then please join us in this journey as we're currently fundraising a series seed round in the sum of $250,000. Um, we're going to use this to expand our technology and um, to prepare to scale across Africa. Um, I can provide more information on this via email as well as um, at the exhibition booth and even answering Q&A here. I know firsthand what, the, what an economically empowered young person can achieve. And I want you to just imagine for a moment that these results were multiplied across millions of young Africans. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Frankola. Um, let's see if we have any questions coming in. Okay. Um, Fakola, maybe you can share with us a bit about um, how has uh, COVID impacted um, your business so far? Um, I would 
Oh, I've often joked they've been one of the COVID winners. So we've been one of the people who have, have somehow benefited from COVID. Although, um, unfortunately, it's because a lot of people have lost their jobs and then they're now turning into uh, turning to entrepreneurship. So we've seen mm -hmm. a surge in more people starting their own businesses and maybe because they've had to take pay cuts because they've lost their jobs. Um, we've also seen a situation where um, more people are addressing COVID problems and so they have to be formalized businesses and so we've um, seen a surge in registrations and um, intellectual property protection as well as um, doc um, contract documentation. Fantastic. Uh, well, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that there's um, a lot of new entrepreneurship ideas that's around COVID that is springing up in Nigeria. I think um, that's really interesting. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, we have a question here. Are these services customized or um, are the processes standardized via tech to deliver it at scale? They're standardized via tech. And so it's, um, it's an intuitive platform where um, whatever a user puts in is the result that they, you know, that they get out of, but of course, with um, some of the work that we've done to make it a lot more legal. Um, so it's, um, we can't, it's not scalable if we had to deal with everyone and provide services one-on-one -on -one and customize, and customize the service. So it's, um, tech and, um, it makes it easily replicable and editable for people to customize by themselves. Okay, great. Um, and another question we have, um, on quality assurance, how do we, how do you ensure that the service providers on the platform are certified and properly delivered and the service properly delivered? We have vetted all the service providers on our platform. Um, we typically do a test, um, say if it was registration, for example, we do a test registration with them and then we see that they keep to the timelines that we have stipulated. Um, we make sure that they're, um, they're professionals as they say they are, so we vet their credentials. And then we also make sure they sign a service level agreement with us so that there are um, um, ways that we can remedy any breaches. Great, terrific. Um, uh, and maybe, um, can you share with us how many service providers you have on the platform at the moment? We have almost 200 service providers and we're vetting more because we're starting to pro provide other services like um, auditing uh, for mm -hmm. people who need to um, hire auditors or HR. And so mm -hmm. it, the numbers are growing by the day. Oh, wow. And are usually the customers um, that uses your service utilizing multiple um, service provider on your platform then? Um, we originally started as providing just legal services. Mm. And we're seeing that people now need a lot more. People need